What's happened in the last 30 years has been an enormous transfer of wealth and power uh, from ordinary Canadians to the people at the very top. Working people in particular need to understand that uh, their lunchbox issues are directly tied to what happens at the ballot box. Why do I vote? What's in it for me? And, and this is a real problem for our democracy. Last election, 1.7 million people didn't vote. Why the hell should I vote? It doesn't matter. The reality is it does matter. It's really critical uh, that people take the opportunity and they get out and they vote. Uh, we know from the past couple of elections that voter turnout has been dropping. Uh, and that's not a good thing for anybody and it's not a good thing for our democracy in British Columbia. It goes beyond voting. We have to do much more than voting. We have to get out and protest and, and have our voices heard in the general debate. Uh, but it also comes down to voting. We will never be able to put in place the kind of politicians we want if we don't hold them to account and if we don't vote for the ones we want. Because everything from the speed bumps on your street in front of your house to forest policy to policy over natural resources to taxation to health care um, to the kind of education your kids are getting at school is determined by politicians either sitting in Victoria or sitting in Ottawa and we need to elect people that represent their communities, represent the people in their communities. Our vote is our most potent weapon against money uh, and in, in democracies whether it's in Canada, whether it's in the US, whether it's in the UK, uh, all around the world, uh, the most important tool that workers have is their ability to vote and to fight for legislation, fight for regulations that will make the lives of ordinary working people better. The powers that exist that are anti-democratic have existed for a long, long, long time. And their interests, of course, uh, you find them in the, uh, the banking industry, the corporate industry of manufacturing, etc., etc. And wherever they are found, their modus operandi is profit. Profit at all costs, and people do not count. It's a great bloody game of Monopoly. The problem is at the end of Monopoly, you fold it all up, had a good laugh, had a good time, you put it away and you go to bed. Now people are putting it away and they're going to bed in the streets. And that's what the economic changes in our society seem to be looking like. Everybody knows that these people are about selling off your wealth, sometimes even giving it away. You re-elect someone who has proved that that's their dream then you give them a mandate, you give them permission. You say, gee, I really like this idea. Wipe out my children's future. Think of the last election in BC and what's happened since then. The HST, uh, many of the anti-labor initiatives that have taken place in BC. Last election, the Liberals won by 2%. A 2% swing would have changed the election. And 1.7 million people didn't vote. And a lot of those were union members. At certain levels, the participation is very low. In municipal voting, uh, the percentage of turnout is very, very low. And I think that's very dangerous. It, 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 is, it is going to destroy our democracy if we don't pay attention to it. It's not a big deal. It's one hour out of one day out of four years. You go tip, the, tip over the apple cart, get some different people, and go on with your life. In British Columbia, we had had, um, now it's 74, but um, I think our map shows 73 manufacturing facilities that have permanently, and that's permanently, closed doors, um, sold off the equipment, gone from the communities since the year 2001. 73 manufacturing facilities, whether that be uh, major sawmills, smaller sawmills, the value-added operations we were talking about earlier, they're gone. Um, the ministerial oversight was taken away from that, so it simply meant the company had the right to basically take their tenure and trade it like kids trade hockey cards. There was no more ministerial oversight, there was no more community review, 
There used to be community reviews, public meetings in communities when there was tenure transfers. That's all gone now. It's just simply a matter of company A has a tenure, they want to sell it to company B, they go ahead and do it. Community doesn't matter. The forest belongs to the people. The communities deserve to get a fair return and they have to know there's going to be forest there in the future. Forest so that they can harvest so their kids and grandchildren can still work in those rural communities and work in the forest industry, but also they can go out and play and recreate in the forest. That's all part of it. Now what kind of rocket scientist works in Victoria They can't figure out that if you have a domestic mill shut down, there's no taxpayers paying taxes that come out of that mill. And on log exports, our plan is simply this. If you pay at the stump, and you change the stumpage arrangement, arrangements to say, you pay your taxes at the back door of the mill. The more value you add to that log, the less you pay for it. You snip it off the stump and put it on a ship and send it somewhere, you pay the full value, equivalent to what that log would have generated when it came out the back door. That will put people to work. That will put this province back in a level of footing. That will put education, health care, municipal issues, everything that we need to do to build a better society. We used to have CCF and SOCREDS and, and everybody got it that wealth here comes from trees and timber and coal and rivers and power and salmon. Like the wealth of, of the land base, that's what we do for work. I, I'm, I was logged for 20 years, so that's what I do. And, and now you have these people who could care less about the land. And in fact, they think that the resource base that made us rich ought really to be privatized and belong to corporations. These natural resources, whether it's trees, water, whether it's minerals, they're our resources. They belong to British Columbians. They belong, and I've said this on the convention floor before, they belong to my grandson. His name is Nathan Singh. We were born, British Columbians, workers here, were born with the patrimony, the wealth, that previous generation said, okay, the companies can work here. We want them to work. We want them to make money. We want them to make jobs, but we own the land. These people stay in government. Your grandchildren got no chance at all. Like, what do you think the BC Rail deal, 999 years, does that? Like, that's, that's privatization and everything they want to do with the forest land, everything they want to do with ore, it's all about giving it away. And your kids, your grandchildren, they'll live in a different country. We will be vassals in our land, or maybe vassals on their land. They gotta go. You bring a guest worker into Canada, they surrender their passport, they're indentured to the employer, they can't quit their job and go somewhere else. They can't look for a job somewhere else. They can't generally complain about their job. They can't complain about health and safety. Because if they do, they're given their passport and a plane ticket back to where they came from. If those workers are good enough to come here and work in Canada, they should be able to come here and live in Canada. They shouldn't be exploited by labor brokers in China and have to pay fees for them to find jobs for them and then be exploited by employers here who charge them exorbitant room and board rates and, and the rest who aren't aware of their rights, who, who risk their health and safety because they don't speak our language and understand our regulations. We don't think that Canada was built that way. Canada was built by saying, if you're good enough, please come here. You want to come here and live here, you can work here. But to, to use this temporary foreign worker program is almost like high, lowly paid slavery. And if anything happens to them that becomes difficult for the employer, they can just be deported and sent home. They have no rights in Canada. They can't become citizens. And not only that, they can be paid less, at least 15% less than the going rate. And as we continue to do that, the going rate drops. So you just keep dropping it by 15% keep dropping it by 15%. We're driving ourselves to the bottom. And while we're driving ourselves to the bottom with the temporary foreign worker program, we are exploiting workers from other countries. So when you think about that, working people should be extremely upset and mad that their government would go off and sign deals 
without informing the people of British Columbia that they're signing off on committing to provide jobs for um, temporary foreign workers. I'm angry as a former uh, workers representative, the idea that uh, our government's gone off to, uh, to China or any other country and signed these sweetheart deals without coming back to BC and introducing legislation and saying this is what we want to do and allow the people to debate, at least the official opposition should have the opportunity to debate it and, and through uh, that the people of BC know what's going on. But we've got a government where there's no transparency, no democracy, it's being undermined. As they say they couldn't get workers here, well, no kidding. Who's going to work for $10, $15 less for a company that has the safety records? Like every day in China, people are killed working in the mines. And it's like the, the Chinese people are expendable. Chinese workers are expendable to these companies. And these are the companies that Harper and even Christy Clark, the premier here in BC, they're making deals with these companies. There's only one reason they're doing it. They're trying to lower wages. They're trying to break unions. I, I think that uh, this is definitely an attack on working people in, in BC. They say they can't get coal miners in Canada. I say bullshit. Maybe she should have went up to McKinsey when the unemployment rate was 85%. It's ridiculous. We need to stand up. There needs to be a plan. We all can work together on this one. Let's make it happen. Steelworkers and us strongly support immigration because when people come here and immigrate and take part and, and uh, work in British Columbia, then they have the right to participate in the community, participate in union, participate in that activity. That's what our grandparents and our parents did after all. In my office here in, in the West Kootenays, we get calls every week from people who have had issues with, with WCB. And it, it seems that it's become a corporation that is more for ensuring that the um, employer's rights are, are, are taken care of as opposed to the worker's rights. And to call it work safe is just, a, it, it's just such hypocrisy. Like you, you tell me any person who goes to work and doesn't want to work safe. I don't know anybody who, who would want to just, oh, I'm not going to work safe today. It, it's such a smack in the face to working people in this province. It's, it's workers' compensation. It's supposed to be there for when people get hurt. And it, it's been downsized. It's been eroded so that people are you know, struggling to, to get the, the benefits they should. Well, one of the things that I come across a lot is dealing with people that have suffered uh, workplace injuries or have been exposed to uh, a harmful substance on the work site. Uh, their pensions, they've cut those by about a half. I mean, um, anyone over the age of 65 that gets diagnosed with uh, some form of illness, you I mean, they got little or no chance of receiving any form of disability. There is some form of compensation for them in personal allowance or house maintenance, but it definitely is not what it used to be. Because workers' compensation is a compromise where workers gave up the right to sue an employer in exchange for no fault and full compensation when they were injured. But there's been a shift. And as I've been teaching workers' compensation advocacy over the last 15 years, I've seen it in the people that I'm teaching too. More and more people think that workers' compensation is an insurance company. And it's behaving more and more like an insurance company where the company benefits if they can deny claims because it has to spend less money. And I think what that means at the end of the day is they look for every tiny loophole that they can find to say that you didn't get hurt at work or that it's not going well. Anything they can find to make an appeal out of it, that's what they do. Their sole purpose is to make sure uh, at the end of the day that you, uh, you don't get WCB, in my opinion. That's what their role is. So that's their goal, and I think that's where they... Um, you know, they would harness uh, praise from their employer at the end of the day if they're successful in making sure you don't get your WCB. The attack on workers' compensation is similar to the attack on unemployment compensation. It's all the attack on the social, what we would call the social infrastructure. And if you push that social infrastructure down so that workers and working families are getting less, then the question's always the same. If they're getting less, where's the rest going? And you'll find that the rest has been going to the top 2%. And that's the fight we have in most of the 
uh, developed economies right now. The purpose of the Mines Act is to put in black and white, very clearly say what a mining company can and cannot do in British Columbia. What they are responsible to provide as far as health and safety standards and what they are, supposed, are responsible to provide as far as uh, environmental controls and how they leave the mountains and the wilderness when they're done. In the last 15 years, well, you know, I had a recent meeting with um, the ministry themselves. Uh, the chief mine inspector, Al Hoffman, along with uh, some of his uh, uh, inspectors. And as far as I understand, in 2003, their office, this ministry, was reduced to the point now that um, they're completely ineffective. They do not have the manpower to effectively enforce this legislation. If you look at the issue in the Elk Valley right now with uh, the selenium in the river, had the ministry been doing what it was supposed to, this problem would have been identified sooner and controls and planning would have had to have happened. So now, now it's a busy cleanup. What are we gonna do? You know, lots of people's livelihoods hang in the balance, the environment hangs in the balance, and the future of mining in this valley hangs in the balance. Because a decade ago, this government cut funding to the department that was supposed to watch that. This is a proven fact. We hear this all the time, don't elect a socially democratic government because, you know, then businesses are going to flee, you know, don't elect Adrian Dix and the BC NDP because, you know, big business is going to flee and we're going to lose all these jobs. But uh, even if that were true, look at the places where these businesses go. The global market and the concept of free trade, which is a, a hollow concept, it doesn't really exist. These are really investment deals that have been put together so that multinational corporations and multinational financiers can move their production from wherever they are to anywhere they want to be. And what they do normally do is shop around all the world where we have these trade deals for where they can get the lowest cost of production with the least interference. In most of the cases, big companies, multinational companies which are based in Mexico, have become uh, the, the ones which exploit the labor force to an extreme in which in some cases whether we have like the new slaves or they work like in a simulated or new concentration camps. The perfect situation for corporations, and they have said this, is they would like all factories to be on barges and move the barges wherever to whatever country offers them the lowest wages, um, the lowest rights, uh, the lowest environmental protection. This is globalization 101. This is happening whether any of us like it or not. And this is just simply the nature of globalism. This is the nature of global capitalism. But there's no government there. There's nobody that anybody elected. There's no democracy there. It's global governance by, for, uh, and about the corporations. We've recognized that. That's why we've built strategic alliances all around the world. We've got strategic alliance with manufacturing unions, with public unions, with mining unions in places like Germany, Australia, South Africa, Mexico, Brazil, the UK, and very, very close alliances with our fellow metal workers. Because we know that with these companies, if we allow that they exploit workers anywhere else, they will come back and exploit us the same. So this is, we sent a strong message to the company and we did it. And they respect very much my views, the views of my colleagues who were b marching by the hundreds or thousands on the streets of Mexico City uh, in defense of the workers' rights of the American workers, members of the United Steel Workers. And that'll be the way that we respond in our own way to the sort of the erosion of global labor rights. We gotta respond with a global response. We can't just respond uh, with a regional response when we're fighting a global war, a global battle about which direction the economy is going to go in. What we have to do here, we have to take some risks. Look around the world, whether it's Greece or Italy, Ireland, England, Venezuela, who just nationalized oil a little while ago and it suited them very nicely. They're funding their schools and building housing. We've got to take some risks. And those risks get really messy, but you can't ask Longshore to resolve the issue. We want to bring this log export to a halt. Longshore will play its role. If we 
want to bring it to the attention of whatever government's in power. The fallers stop working, the truck drivers stop working, the mill workers stop working, we stop putting it on rails, and Longshore won't load those logs on ships. It's that simple, it's called Educate our membership, educate the public, educate our co-workers, educate our friends and family, and then bring that to the ballot box.